At dawn on New Year's Day, 1963, a respected scientist and the wife of his colleague left a sedate party for the privacy of a lover's lane. What happened next would confound forensic scientists and scandalize conservative society. The deaths were no repetition of countless other crimes. There were no clues as to how the couple died. This was by far the biggest crime case up to that stage in Australia, and I'm not sure whether there would be one to match it now. They were convinced that I was the killer, and they did everything they could to sort of prove that that was the case. This case ranks as the most mysterious, possibly the most mysterious. As a matter of fact, I can't recall anything that I've read about happening in the whole of the world. I'm quite sure that there's a solution. There must be a solution. An unprecedented forensic investigation failed to identify what caused the deaths of Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler. But now, for the first time, a new witness and fresh evidence provide the solution to one of the most baffling cases in the history of crime. The New South Wales police were used to attending murders, but these were unlike any they'd ever seen. Of course, the big thing which intrigued me and all the other investigators from day one was the aspect of the bodies being covered. The clothing was so neatly placed over the body in such a manner that the man could not possibly have done it himself and there was a carpet square on top of his shirt, but underneath his suit coat. And that, I still feel, was a very, very unusual thing. And about 40 feet further along the river, they discovered the body of the lady lying underneath opened out beer cartons and her clothing was disturbed. And there was mud on her knees and feet. And she had a couple of very minor abrasions, one on her nose, and I think on her shoulder. It looked like she'd brushed against a twig. If the state of the bodies, covered as they were, wasn't unusual enough, there was something even more baffling. 
The victims had been physically ill, but there were no other signs as to how the couple had met their fate. There was no sign of any violence in the bodies. There was no bullet holes and knife marks or anything like that. Two healthy bodies, uh, young bodies, and uh, we couldn't find any cause of their death. Here you had what appeared to be apparent lovers ending up uh, semi-naked dead uh, on the rank, uh, banks of a river on New Year's Day. Now that is a terrific story under any circumstances in any country. It allowed for the imagination to run wild as to how that happened. Mr. Chandler? Yes. What's the time? <laughs> Jeffrey Chandler, the husband of Mrs. Chandler, was virtually from the outset regarded as our number one suspect. This is based on police experience all over the world that when you have a death, the person closest to them, either the husband or the wife, very often finishes up as to being the person who caused the death. Geoffrey Chandler? Yes. Is your wife's name Margaret Olive Chandler? Yes. Could you tell me where your wife is? I'm not sure where she is. They took me to Chesswood Police Station. By this time, the newspapers, I think it was the Daily Mirror, uh, had an edition out with some great splurge on the front page, and they showed that to me. Quite sort of cold-bloodedly. Uh, to gauge my reaction, I guess. Do you know Dr. Gilbert Stanley Bogle? Yes. He's a colleague. All the laboratories are in the same building. Did your wife know Dr. Bogle well? No. She didn't know him very well. <laughs> Only ten days earlier, at a field station of the government's scientific research organization, CSIRO, Mrs. Margaret Chandler met Dr. Gilbert Bogle for the first time. The brilliant New Zealand-born physicist spoke several languages and was an accomplished musician. A popular man without apparent enemies, according to his friends and colleagues, but a man with little more than a week to live. I had an acquaintance with Jib. I didn't know him terribly well. So he was a senior research officer. I was just a lowly technician, so to speak. Charming, witty, all those sort of things. He plays beautifully, doesn't he? By comparison, I, I felt sort of quite insignificant, really. They struck up an acquaintanceship at the Murray Bridge party. She was flattered by his attentions and he was attracted to her because she was a very pretty and lovely, lovely lady. Ah, some more. Who have we got here now? Ah, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah. Nice to see you. Margaret, come on in, come on in. 
The only time the victims met again was the night before they died, at a New Year's party hosted by CSIRO photographer Ken Nash and his elegant wife, Ruth. Everybody, I'd like you to meet Margaret and Geoffrey Chandler. I'll uh, get you a drink, yeah? Uh, Margaret, come with me. I've got some name tags. I know you don't know everybody, so this will help. There we go. <laughs> well, you need some assistance? Well, yes, Skip. Why don't you take over? Thank you. <laughs> Is your wife here? No, the little one's off colour. I should have stayed at home, I suppose. And why didn't you? I'd not see you again. I think the reason why we got the invitation was because of Gibbs' attraction to Margaret, or his desire to see her again. Ken Nash party was pretentious and iffy. So we sort of made this arrangement. If Margaret wanted to continue the evening with Gibb, then that was fine. And then I would take myself off to, to the other party, to Buckley's party, which was more to my liking. Geoffrey Chandler's movements that night came under intense police scrutiny. Why had he left the party alone to attend another made up of intellectuals, libertarians, and anarchists who called themselves the Push. Riling against the values of conservative Australia, the Push encouraged liberal views on sex, a fact that would turn the case into a tabloid sensation. But to the police, Geoffrey Chandler's adulterous relationship with a young woman at the party suggested a possible motive for murder. Instead of being constrained by conventional morality and conventional religion and conventional society, so you had freedom to, to indulge whatever you liked. If you wanted to have sex with somebody who was mutually attractive, then you went and did it. How long have you had this association with Miss Logan? I don't know exactly. Oh, approximately. Five months or so. Did your wife know about this? She seemed to be aware that I was involved with someone. She didn't know it was Miss Logan. In those days, it was considered uh, absolutely scandalous. The society was still largely under the thumb of the churches and the RSL and politicians who were very conservative. And it was a very unrealistic society because it wasn't paying attention to what its young people especially were, were all about. The scandalous nature of the case fascinated the public. But what they didn't learn was the extent of Dr. Bogle's double life. Dr. Bogle was, to all intents and purposes, a very happily married man. He had children. However, despite that, Dr. Bogle did engage in a number of illicit relationships uh, with other women. Mr. Nash, how long have you known Dr. Bogle? About five years. And during that time, has it ever come to your knowledge that he is a known and reputed habitual flirt? <laughs> I had observed him being flirtatious on numerous occasions. I always accepted it as a harmless and fun-loving way of contributing to the overall merriment of the evening.
Were you ever jealous of him making over to us to your wife? No. <laughs> Mr. Nash, did you see any um, undue friendliness between Mrs. Chandler and Dr. Bogle that night? At no time. At 2.45 a.m., after an absence of more than three hours, Jeffrey Chandler returned to the Nash party for a short time. Where have you been? I went to get some cigarettes. Would you like a drink? No. Did you have an argument with your wife? No. Why then did you leave the party without your wife? I left the party by arrangement after a discussion with my wife. Arrangement? Are you ready to go now? I'm pretty tired. I'll stay. I'll pick up the boys. Tell them not to worry. Right. They wanted to go home together. I had no objection towards this. They were attracted to each other. I waited a few minutes to see if she changed her mind. I didn't want to leave her in the street. The events of the next hour lie at the heart of the mystery. Jeffrey Chandler told police he assumed his wife and Dr. Bogle would drive to the privacy of the Chandler home in Croydon, some 25 minutes away. Instead, the couple drove to the Lane Cove River, a journey of only six minutes. Within the hour, both would be dead. That particular area was a very well-known area which could be described as a taillight alley where people went to make love. Meanwhile, Geoffrey Chandler claimed he had driven across the Harbour Bridge to the home of his lover, Pamela Logan. So you stayed with Miss Logan? No. We went to collect the children from Margaret's parents' place at Granville. You took your girlfriend to your wife's parents' home. She stayed on Parramatta Road while I went to get the children. We've been talking to Geoffrey Chandler. He's um, told us certain things. He suggests that you can confirm them. What do you want them for? You knew Mr Chandler was married? Yes. Does Mrs. Chandler know about you? Look, I don't want to answer anything. Do you know that Mrs. Chandler and a Dr. Gilbert Bogle were found dead this morning? <laughs> Pamela Logan supported Geoffrey Chandler's alibi, as did two independent witnesses who'd seen the pair together in his distinctive vintage car. So, at this particular time, um, he was doing exactly as he claimed he was doing. And this was around the time that uh, Bogle and Mrs Chandler were down on the banks of the river and met their fate. Geoffrey Chandler had a seemingly waterproof alibi but the police remained convinced his reaction to his wife's death was suspicious. I was summoned down to the old morgue. Uh, you couldn't have possibly have conceived of a more callous 
way in which she was presented and which they all arraigned themselves to watch my every little action to see whether I was going to break down, whether I was going to confess. Can you identify this person? She's a bit dishevelled, isn't she? He gave every indication of being completely blasé about his wife's death. He certainly didn't show any emotion or great upset. She was quite a nice looking girl. The type of woman that she would say it would be wholesome. I couldn't believe it because the day before she had visited me. She brought some puppies out for me to look at and give an opinion. And she stayed talking and chatting. You know, we started talking as women do. And I'd had a few words with my husband. It turned out she'd had a disagreement with her husband. And I remember saying, oh, they should burn all men, <coughs> which made her laugh. Um, he struck me as a man who would have quite a brilliant mind, but not a man who would talk too much about it. Typical scientist. I mean, I know there were all sorts of talks of them being a swinging couple. I mean, even so, it, sex doesn't kill you. If anyone was to be prosecuted for murder, the investigators first had to identify the cause of death. In the absence of any external or internal evidence at autopsy, there could only be one answer. And it looked like as if, and everyone agreed, that it was a poison. Myself and, and the other investigators we felt that Geoffrey Chandler was the logical suspect. And we left absolutely no stones unturned to try to establish the evidence to connect him with the deaths. There was no physical evidence of, of, of being attacked. It could only be one thing. Put it this way, something entered those two bodies. They had to have consumed something, inhaled something, or absorbed something through the skin. And we generally get the stomach, the liver, kidney, spleen, uh, small intestine. If there's any poisons being taken, then that's where they would end up. I'd say after three days, everything was coming up negative. I knew then that this was going to be a challenge to me anyhow. I never realised it was going to be such a challenge. With pressure mounting for a result, the investigators returned to the scene of the crime. Police divers scoured the river bottom for syringes and bottles of poison. On shore, a search was carried out for evidence of venomous spiders. At the laboratories of both Dr. Bogle and Geoffrey Chandler, scientific detectives collected poisons and chemicals. Pathologists scanned the bodies of the victims for the presence of radioactivity. With the assistance of police agencies around the world, an extraordinary list of other obscure poisons and drugs was compiled. Hallucinogens, poison darts from the Amazon, even aphrodisiacs. Hundreds upon hundreds of chemicals were tested for. Each proved negative. Unreal things were coming left, right and centre. And you've got to look into it. If I get a directive from the Minister for Health to do it, I've, I've got to do it. This is Pawsey uh, earlier today. In a breakthrough, detectives discovered a receipt in a handbag belonging to Mrs Chandler. They visited Mrs Sheridan Pawsey a dash hound breeder, inquiring about dog worming tablets she'd prescribed for the family dogs. Of course. 
They said, are they safe? And I said, no, they're not safe to, for people to, you know, to sit and, and, and guzzle. And the fact that I'd given her some pills, of course, was meat and drink to the, the, the newspapers. Newspapers declared the tablets were used in a party prank or by the victims in a suicide pact. But there was no evidence of the tablets in the victim's organs. This was a sensational crime by any standard, but it happened to break at a time when Sydney was in the midst of a vicious uh, war between two tabloid afternoon newspapers, The Sun and The Mirror. They were like two professional wrestlers trying to appeal to the readers. And so it was a really, then, it was uh, all stops out. Interest in the mystery reached fever pitch when a tabloid newspaper suggested Dr. Bogle's scientific work was somehow behind the deaths. His groundbreaking research on mazes, a low-noise microwave receiver, was set to revolutionize radio astronomy. Of course, a story like this attracts a lot of rumor mongering, and when you don't know, you kind of make it up. And in those days, uh, which was the height of the Cold War and worried about the atomic bomb and everything else, so stories about a death ray or a, a, a secret um, nuclear thing or working for the CIA, uh, uh, all of these things were grist for the mill. Fueling the theory, Dr. Bogle's recent resignation from the CSIRO to take up a post with the American electronics giant, Bell Laboratories. The Daily Mirror speculated that Dr. Bogle might have been assassinated to prevent his research being used in top secret defense projects. The uh, workings of the, the Mesa were well publicized, published over many years in, in engineering journals, scientific journals. Uh, I don't think there were any uh, real secrets left. Gibb wouldn't have been a top man there by any means, I don't think. He wouldn't have been worth killing, put it that way. Stories of ray guns and illicit affairs sold newspapers. But the police were desperate for hard facts. Every investigator was completely convinced that there was a third person involved. Not so much as the perpetrator or the person who caused their deaths, but certainly some person must have been present to cover the bodies in the way they were. Detectives found a man who, under interrogation, admitted he was a voyeur. His presence at the river on New Year's morning appears to have prompted Dr. Bogle to move his car. He claimed that half an hour later, he walked past the vehicle and found it empty. He then drove down the bush track, but insisted he didn't see the couple, dead or alive. Now, so far as covering up the bodies, I would doubt that Chalice is the person responsible. Mainly because Chalice only has one arm. And I would feel a one-armed person would have had a great lot of difficulty putting the clothes over Dr. Bogle in the manner that they were. The police also questioned a greyhound trainer and SP bookmaker who illegally exercised his dogs on a nearby golf course. Mr. Eddie Batiste claimed he took a different track to and from the course and didn't see the bodies. But that morning, he arrived home very agitated. His son was convinced his father, a man of strict morals, not only stumbled upon the half-naked bodies, but also covered them. The trainer's obituary 
recently discovered in a Greyhound magazine from 1977, backs the theory. It states that Eddie Batiste did find the bodies, suggesting he must have confided in someone. Despite this new tantalizing evidence, absolute proof of the identity of the person who covered the bodies remains elusive. The coronial inquest, which ran for two months, was the longest yet in the state's history. So help me God. A surprise witness was a former colleague of Dr. Bogle, Mrs. Margaret Fowler. She had revealed to detectives details of how and where the scientist carried out another of his illicit affairs. A few nights later, he took me to a park. We were lying on the ground and he was more tender than usual. He said to me he wanted to call it off. I said, if you do, I'll die. But the Bogle family's legal representative protested. The witness is dismissed. The coroner deemed Mrs. Fowler's testimony not relevant. He stood down the witness, he said, to protect innocent people and to prevent further scandalizing the proceedings. It is certainly true, isn't it, Mr. Chandler? that it was your suggestion that Dr. Bogle drive your wife home from the Nash party? Yes. She was, of course, a good mother. An excellent mother. Mr. Chandler, this was a great tragedy and a great blow to you? Yes. A great tragedy. Of all the testimony, the most eagerly anticipated by the public was that of the government analyst, who was to finally reveal the identity of the poison. Dr. Ogg, can you tell the inquest the results of your analysis? The net results of our inquiry showed nothing in the organs of Dr. Bogle or Mrs. Chandler to indicate the presence of any poisonous substance. Can you say that all the poisons you had in mind you tested for? Yes. One finds it hard to believe that notwithstanding the wealth of evidence that has been presented, I'm no more able to fulfill the charge placed on me, that is, to ascertain the manner and cause of the death of these two people, as I was the day I opened the inquest. There is one thing, however, that I feel I can say with absolute certainty. That is that each of these persons died an unnatural death. The Bogle Chandler investigation had collapsed. Someone had committed the perfect double murder with the perfect poison and had escaped prosecution. For the families, an open finding was the worst of outcomes. Mrs. Bogle, described by the press as the unknown living victim of the tragedy, returned home to New Zealand with her four children. Geoffrey Chandler was our logical suspect. He was the media's logical suspect. He was the public's logical suspect. And he's remained, for many years, the logical suspect. Every year, the bloody newspapers would have a full page spread of pictures and rehash of what happened in New Year's Eve 1963. Every year. And every year, here these children could see and read and hear all about it. The whole of their school had this refreshed every year. 
did these newspaper people think of that sort of thing? No, 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 no. Yes, impacted on the children. The elder boy remembered his mother. He was two. So suddenly there's no mother. The younger boy didn't have such a immediate awareness, but in the ensuing years, all those chickens came home to roost. All three of us have suffered quite severe psychological and emotional damage arising from this event. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, media interest in the case continued unabated. Bizarre new theories added to the 1,000 already held in police records. But in 1996 came news of a startling breakthrough. The Institute of Forensic Medicine had dispatched tissue samples to a private pathologist in America for testing for LSD. An initial screening suggested the hallucinogenic drug was present in the tissues. The mystery finally appeared solved. But a second, more sensitive round of tests proved negative. Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler had not overdosed on LSD. After more than four decades, the Bogle-Chandler case continues to mystify forensic scientists around the world. But for the first time, a witness to the tragedy can be presented, a witness the investigators and the coroner had overlooked, the river itself. In the early 1900s, the waterway was a recreational haven for families, workers groups and social clubs. But in the 1940s, the river began to lose favour with visitors who complained of a strange gaseous odour. And nearby residents noticed that their bath fittings and paintwork were discolouring. Increasingly, they suffered nausea and unexplained illnesses. Some reported finding their children at night gasping for breath. The problem came for months at a time, year after year. Concerned about the residents' health, the local council alerted the state government that houses near the river might have to be permanently evacuated. In 1948, under government orders, maritime scientist Maurice Fry began a year-long investigation of the river. I didn't feel too good when I was actually working on the river because the, the concentration of noxious gas was quite high. One would not have chosen to be out on the river. It was only a matter of necessity. There was a natural source of gases all along the waterway, the mangroves where organic matter is constantly broken down. But as Morris Fry discovered, they were not the only source. By chance, he witnessed an extraordinary event. The river bottom exploded, something he'd never seen before. On the surface, you could see the mud uh, on the surface board and it was in motion, it was going round and round and it was quite black. There was a great destruction of the fish in the river that the council and they picked them up by lorry loads. And the eels, that was remarkable, they were all up at the weir, they were trying to jump up over the uh, weir into the fresh water.
Maurice Fry immediately identified the reason for the explosive event in the fish kills by its pungent odor of rotten eggs, a gas called hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide gas is potentially deadly, almost as toxic as cyanide gas. Most of us can, can pick up the smell of hydrogen sulfide at of extremely sub low, low concentrations of way less than a part per million. It isn't really toxic. It, it's annoying because it doesn't smell very good. But it doesn't take any serious toxicity on until it reaches about 50 to 100 parts per million. But if it gets much higher than that, and if it gets into the two or 300 parts per million, then it begins to take an effect on the brain. Uh, at about 750 parts per million, you're in danger of dying, and most people do. Forensic toxicologist Thomas Milby is a world authority on hydrogen sulfide poisoning. In the last 40 years, he's investigated more than 100 cases, many of them fatal. He has been asked to assess whether hydrogen sulfide could have killed Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler. I read those two autopsy reports carefully. The probabilities were it was an inhaled gas as opposed to a pill or something like that. And I saw nothing in either report that would, in my opinion, exclude the possibility of hydrogen sulfide as being the, the culprit that killed them. If hydrogen sulfide was the instrument of death, why wasn't the gas detected in the tissues of the victims? If you just find a dead body and there's no reason to think of hydrogen sulfide, the autopsy will show nothing. Hydrogen sulfide attacks the brain, and it, as I've said, and it does it quickly, and it does it without leaving much evidence that it was there. But there is strong circumstantial evidence for the presence of the gas on New Year's morning, 1963. Observers described the river as black and murky, so polluted that the search of the river bottom by police divers had to be delayed for 11 days. Another explosive event, like that witnessed by Maurice Fry in 1948, appears to have occurred just before the deaths. In the natural environment, the heavier-than-air gas is most concentrated in the cool, still air of dawn, exactly the time the couple arrived at the river. But it raises the question as to why Dr. Bogle, a scientist, didn't recognize its pungent odor. Once it gets up to about 150 parts per million, which is not very high, it almost immediately it anesthetizes the... the uh, the nerves we have on our nose that are responsible for picking up odors, so you don't smell it. Crime scene photographs reveal that the couple had chosen an extremely dangerous place to seek privacy. Shoes, a leather belt, and underclothes lay spread out on the exposed riverbed. These photographs and the polluted state of the river support the theory for hydrogen sulfide poisoning. This meter deep bowl-shaped depression is the area where the couple lay down. And on the other side of me is a heavy growth of mangrove plants. Hydrogen sulfide gas, which is slightly heavier than air, can accumulate in areas like this, and there's a long record of it doing so in other parts of the world. And in the early morning, before the sun comes up, before the breezes begin, that hydrogen sulfide would sit silently and invisibly in this bowl. And this would be the last place in the world where anyone would want to lie down in the ground. There is also evidence suppressed by the coroner to protect public morality that should have impacted on the search for the poison. 
a patch of semen was found on the inside of Dr. Bogle's coat. The significant feature, so far as I'm concerned, was that there was sperm associated with Dr. Bogle's penis, which seems to indicate that the sperm in the coat was quite fresh. The presence of fresh semen means that the couple were unlikely to be suffering any ill effects of a poison when they arrived at the river to make love. But this vital evidence was not passed on to the chief toxicologist, the scientist who spent 15 months vainly searching for the poison. I'm sort of a little annoyed that it wasn't available to me at that time because it, it points me in a, in a totally different direction. I'm annoyed that I spent a lot of time on, on poisons that didn't fit the circumstances. 42 years on, I feel this Bogle and Chandler case could have been solved within weeks. Had there been a cooperation between the three departments, the police, the pathology that did the autopsy, and myself at the government analyst. The chief toxicologist didn't consider hydrogen sulfide as a possible cause of death. But for the first time, he reveals details of an abnormality in the victim's samples. When compared to standard haemoglobin, their blood had a strange coloration. Have you ever seen anything like that before? I thought it was unusual that both bloods had a, a purplish coloration. Well, that, to me, indicated that they'd both died the same way. It was too much of a coincidence that they, even if they had different blood groups, I didn't find anything at that time that sort of explained an off-colour to the haemoglobin. If they found a strange purplish coloration in the blood and other causes of death were ruled out, that would indicate that hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide alone was the cause of death because hydrogen sulfide does cause a purplish or a greenish purplish color to the blood occasionally and to the tissue sometimes, not all the time, but it does often enough that that would be a, the indication that that's what caused the death. It is a fingerprint that identifies hydrogen sulfide. The only question remaining is what caused the explosive buildup of poisonous gas in the Lane Cove River. During his investigations in 1948, Maurice Fry identified two reasons. For 60 years, a flour and starch factory on the river's edge had pumped sulfurous waste into the waterway. The building of a weir in the late 1930s exacerbated the pollution by stopping the natural tidal flushing of the river. Fry's report forced the factories on the waterway to treat their waste and divert it into the sewer. But the problem wasn't eliminated. One of the city's major sewer pipes lay across the river bottom. In times of heavy rain, an overflow valve siphoned sewage directly into the waterway. Every year, billions of litres of untreated human and industrial waste laden with sulphurous material flowed into the river. While today the gas in the river bottom is not at toxic levels, in the 1960s, hydrogen sulphide events and fish kills continued. The most toxic area where much of the waste settled was within 400 metres downstream of the weir, beside the lover's lane where Dr Bogle and Mrs Chandler were to meet their fate. On an unseasonally cool New Year's morning in 1963, there appears to have been a rare but highly dangerous convergence of circumstances. Circumstances 
never contemplated by the original investigators. I think that they would have realized pretty fast that something was wrong. They would become disoriented. And they might try to get out and stumble backwards, and they can do all sorts of things that you can conceive of someone who is, is semi-unconscious, actually. If the concentration is high enough of hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere, when it gets into the blood, it immediately shuts off the ability of the brain to use oxygen, even though there's plenty of oxygen around. It's like putting a plastic bag over the brain. The evidence that we do have is so strong, extremely consistent with hydrogen sulfide related death, and I can think of nothing else, neither gas nor any other kind of poison or anything, that could argue against that hypothesis. It just seems to me to be unassailable. If it could be established, well then, I think, would be a very satisfying solution. And I think it would be a very nice thing to, to be able to put a full stop to the whole matter. It seemed completely feasible. Sort of the most realistic and sensible theory on the course of death that come up in the last 20 or 30 years makes it just an accident a very very unfortunate accident every day is is, is a reminder because it's different to what it ought to have been and what it would have been if she hadn't gone down there then i would be still a happily married man and life would have been different. You can't go back. And that's the sad part. The hauntingly beautiful Lane Cove River was the backdrop for one of the world's greatest forensic mysteries, the deaths of Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler. But no one suspected that the lives of the victims and the river itself were so intimately entwined, or that the fate of the lovers was tragically timed to a silent cry from the river dying.